Chapter 3 Ait If the demon, Bear, represented salvation, then he also represented a final submission. The uplander no longer needed to fight the cold to stay awake, or the pain to stay alive. He let go, and sank like a rock into the glassy silence of a freezing sea. Pain devoured him. It beset him like a blizzard, so violent and furious that he could see it, even... Alrighty, hello once again. This is the Resurrected Hobbyist. Uh, as you can see, I am, uh, blah, blah, excuse me, I found a artist today, uh, Gabe Thorne, who's been having a lot of fun with his uh, set of um, Pro Burning of Prospero, and I really want to kind of, you know, call attention to it and point out his work. So before we really get into any of that, uh, where did I put that link? There it is. Oops. I wanted to go over some of his work real quick. Uh, this is Gabe's uh, portfolio website. Uh, you can get to it from the address displayed on screen. Uh, the one that caught my attention today was the Prospero Burns uh, duet. And I got the uh, Space Wolf literally gut, or uh, check, bleh. wow, I can not speak tonight. You have the Space Wolf literally uh, kicking the Thousand Sun. Uh, oh, where's the other one? Oh, pity. Oh, no, there it is. Sorry. And then there's also the other Space Wolf giving a Thousand Sun a noogie. So, as much of a Thousand Sun player as I am, uh, this does hurt me a little bit, but as a modeler, I gotta say, these are cool. It's, it's enjoyable when I see someone take something that's, you know, as dark and twisted as, you know, the Betrayal at Prospero, and, you know, have a little bit of fun with it. It's kind of a nice refresher. Uh, but beyond that, he's got a rather impressive array of other uh, projects he's done. Yeah, this is Zinchi and Heldrake, which I admit I may have to copy the idea for, because that's really kind of cool. Yeah, I love the gradation work in the uh, wings, coming from the white out to the green-yellow, out to the green-blue, to the blue, to the blue-white, and then back to the white and all the way back through each section of the wings. That is really kind of cool. Eldar Wraithseer. The always classic Warhound Titan stepping on something. Looks like a rhino. Yep. Oh, a uh, Heresy Era rhino, no less.
Uh, what do we have here? Ooh, Eldar Warp Spiders. And those are converted Warp Spiders, even better. I like the Warp Field effect on these. Yeah, there's the shot I was hoping for. I'm not sure about the Necron Tesla arc rifles for the uh, Spinnerack guns, but I do like how he's got them modeled so that they're stepping out of the warp breach. Oh, an Avatar of Cain. Yeah, complete with a bloody hand. I like the blood effect. Ah, that's a nice touch. The other thing I really like in this one is how you got he's got the lava effect kind of seeping through the cooler, dried brass and rock. Gives it this almost kind of a wounded warrior, yet I'm never going to give up kind of look. Like if you're in a movie, you just see a dude, he's been shot like eight times, and yet he's still on the fight. pretty much what it gives me the image of here so anyway as I as I said uh, that is the work of Gabriel Thorne uh, I ran across his work today on Facebook and I'm like okay this needs to be shown uh, when I was chatting with him earlier he said he's planning on doing a uh, Lehman Russ model next so I'm kind of looking forward to that to see where it goes uh, but as I said, you can check out his work at the URL up at the top of the page right now. But let's get back to work. So, I believe yesterday we left off at the end of Chapter 2 of Prospero Burns. So tonight, uh, we're going to be picking up with Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Fight. If the demon bear represented salvation, then he also represented a final submission. The Uplander no longer... And we are also going to be starting work on... The Custodes tonight. Custodian. Custodes. Uh, tonight. Uh, since I'm only going to be on for about an hour and a half, two hours, uh, the big objective I want tonight is to get all the legs mounted on the bases. Uh, that way I can just kind of pick up where I leave off next time. So let's go ahead and get started. of stable instead of particles of snow, a faulty pit feed, the signal trash of a damaged magnetic optic, just fuzz, just buzzing white speckles against, against blackness. The blackness, now that had to be real, it was so solid, solid blackness. Unless it was blindness, his eye hurt, the absence of it hurt, the socket where his eye had been. Snow and static, blackness and blindness. The values interchanged. He couldn't tell them apart. His core temperature was plummeting. Pain was being diluted with numbness. The uplander knew he had long since ceased to be a reliable witness of events. Consciousness refused to reignite in any stable fashion. He was caught in an ugly cleft of half a wens, a pitiful foxhole in the lee side of a snowbank of insensibility. It was unbearably hard to distinguish between memories and pain dreams. Was he seeing white noise on a blacked out display screen? Or blizzarding snow against solid black rock? It was impossible to tell. He fancied the blackness was a mountain beyond the snow. A mountain that was too big to be a mountain. A black tooth of rock that loomed out of the blizzard, broader and taller than could be taken in at a single glance. It was so big that it had already filled his field of vision, up and down and side to side, before he even realized it was there. 
At first, he thought it was the blackness of the polar sky, but no, it was a solid wall of rock rushing towards him. He sighed, reassured, able at last to comfort himself by definitively separating one memory fact from dream fiction. The mountain, that was definitely a dream. No mountain could be that big. He was carried in out of the storm, down into the warm and muffled blackness of a deep cave. He lay there and dreamed some more. The uplander dreamed for a long time. The dream started out as pain dreams, sharpened by the pangs of his injuries, distorted by opiates flooding into his bloodstream. They were fragments, sharp and imperfect, like segments of a puzzle or pieces of a broken mirror interspersed with deadened periods of unconsciousness. They reminded him of the moves of a regicide game, a match between two experienced players. Slow, considered moves, strategically deep, separated by long stretches of contemplative inaction. The regicide board was old and inlaid with ivory. He could smell the lint that had collected in the corners of the board's case. Nearby, there was a small toy horse made of wood. He was drinking rad apple juice. Someone was playing the clavier. The sharp edges of his mental fragments dulled, and the dreams became longer and more complex. He began to dream his way through epic cycles of dreams. They lasted years. They enumerated generations. They saw the ice encroach and thaw away again. The ocean harden and return to motion. The sun rush across the cloud-barred sky like a disk of beaten copper, winking, glittering, growing bright like a nova, and then dull like a dead stellar ember. Day, night, day, night. Inside the dreams, men came to him and sat by him in the secret room of the cave. They talked. A fire was burning. He could smell the copal resin smoking into the air. Hmm. He could not see the men, but he could see their shadows cast up the cave wall by the spitting fire. They were not human. The shadow shapes had animal heads or antlers or horns sometimes. The man shapes sat and panted through dog snouts. Spiked branches of horn crest nodded as others spoke. Some were hunched with a weighty shoulder hump of winter fat cattle. After a while, he became uncertain if he was seeing shadows on the cave wall or ancient varietal art smudged lines of ochre and charcoal that had been lent the illusion of movement by the inconstant flames. He tried to listen to what was being said by the men during the long mumbling conversations, but he couldn't concentrate. He thought that if he was able to focus, he would hear all the secrets of the world come tumbling out in a murmured river and learn every story from the very first to the very last. Sometimes the uplander's dreams picked him up and carried him outside the cave. They took him up to some high vantage, where there were only stars overhead, in a roof of velvet blue and sunlit lands below. A tapestry of worlds, all sewn together, all the worlds in creation, like the inlaid board of a great game. And on that board, epic histories played out for him. Nations and empires, creeds and races, rising and falling, bonding and fighting, forming alliances, making war. He witnessed unifications, annihilations, reformations, annexations, invasions, expansions, enlightenments. He saw it all from his lofty vantage, a seat so high and precarious that sometimes he had to cling on to the throne's golden arms for fear of falling. Sometimes his dreams swept him back inside himself, into his own flesh, into his own blood. And there, at a microscopic level, he observed the universe of his own body as it disassembled atom from atom. His essence sampled down to the smallest genetic packet, like light sifted and split into its component colors by a subtle lens. He felt he was being dismantled, working part from working part, like an old timepiece, and every last piece of the damascened movement laid out for repair. He felt like a biological sample, a laboratory animal, belly slit and pegged open, its organs removed one by one like the gears of a pocket like an insect, pinned and minutely sectioned for a glass slide to learn what made it tick. When his dreams took him back to the cave, where the Therianthrope shadow sat muttering in the firelight, he often felt as if he'd been put back together in an altogether different order. 
If he was an old timepiece, then his dismantled movement had been rearranged, and some parts cleaned or modified or replaced. And then his mainspring and his escapement, his going train and his balance wheel, and all his tiny levers and pins had been put back together in some invented new sequence, and his cover screwed shut so that no one could see how he had been re-engineered. And when he was back in the cave, he thought about the cave itself. Warm, secure, deep in the black rock, out of the storm. But had he been taken back there for his own protection, or had he been taken back there for safekeeping until the man shapes around the fire got hungry? Three, 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 four. The strangest and most infrequent dreams of all were of the coldest, deepest part of the cave, where a voice spoke to him. In this place, there was only blackness cut by a cold blue glow. The air smelled sterile like rock in a dry polar highland that lacked any water to form ice. It was far away from the soft warmth and the firelight of the cave, far away from the fraternity of murmuring voices and the smell of smouldering resin. The uplander's limbs felt leaden there, as though he had swallowed ice, as though cold liquid metal ran in his veins and weighed him down. Even his thoughts were slow and viscous. He fought against the Arctic slowness, Afraid to let it pull him down into dreamless sleep and death. The best he could muster felt like a feeble twitch of his heavy limbs. Be still. That was the first thing the voice said to him. It was so sudden and unexpected he froze. Be still, the voice repeated. It was a deep, hollow voice, a whisper that carried the force of thunder. It wasn't particularly human. It sounded as if it had been fashioned out of the bleating, droning notes of an old signal horn. Each syllable and vowel sound was simply the same low, reverberative noise, sampled and tonally adjusted. Be still. Stop your twitching and your wriggling. Where am I? The uplander asked. In the dark, the voice replied. It sounded further away, a ram's horn braying on a lonely cliff. Three, four, and thirty-three. Yeah, there's thirty-four. Then the voice came again, directly behind the Thirty-two, thirty-eight, thirty-five. You don't have to understand the dark. That's the thing about the dark. It doesn't. There we go. Be understood. It's just the dark. It is what it is. What am I doing here? He asked. When the voice answered, it had receded. It came as a rumble from somewhere ahead of him, like the sound of a wind moaning through empty caves. It said, You're here to be. You're here to dream the dreams. That's all. So just dream the dreams. They'll help pass the time. Uplander hesitated. He didn't like the threat of anger in the voice. I don't like it here, <laughs> he ventured at length. None of us like it here, the voice boomed right in the Uplander's left ear. He let out an involuntary squeak of terror. Not only was the voice loud and close and angry, but there was a wet leopard growl in its thunder. None of us like it here, the voice repeated, calmer now, circling him in the darkness. None of us choose to be here. We miss the firelight. We miss the sunlight. We've dreamed all the dreams they give us a hundred times over. A thousand times. We know them off by heart. We don't choose the dark. There was a long pause. Chooses us. <laughs> the uplander asked. I was called Cormac, the voice said. Cormac Dodd. How long have you been here, Cormac Dodd? Pause, then a rumble. I forget. 
How long have I been here? I don't even know who you are, the voice replied. Just be still and shut up your racket and stop disturbing me. Then the uplander woke up, and he was still on the metal stretcher Baird strapped him to. The stretcher was swaying slightly, suspended. The uplander's vision swam into focus, and he looked up, up at the chains rising from the four corners of the stretcher. They all met at a central ring and became a single, thicker length of chain. The main chain, dark and oiled, extended up and away into the oppressive twilight of the vast roof space above him. It felt like a cave, an enormous cave, but it wasn't the green cave that the enemy men had murmured by the firelight, and it wasn't the deep, cold cave with the blue glow either. Everything was in shadow, in a twilight of a greenish cast. From what he could make out in the half-light, the cave was a vast space, like the nave of a cathedral or the belly hold of a void ship. And it wasn't actually a cave, because the structural angles and edges were too straight and regular. The uplander couldn't turn his head or move his limbs, but he was relieved to find that he was no longer in pain. There was not even a vestigial nag of discomfort from his torso or his shattered legs. His now we go. was rather eclipsed by the anxiety felt at his new situation. Trapped and pinned, strapped down. Hopefully you guys don't get too airsick from that. The black roof space above. A dull, drowsy weight on his heart made him feel sluggish and leaden as if he'd taken a tranquilizer or a sleeping draft. He blinked, wishing he could rub the grit out of his eyes, wishing the stretcher would stop swinging. A swaying length of thick chain ran back down out of the darkness at an oblique angle to the central chain supporting him. And from its rhythmic jolts, it seemed clear that he was being hoisted up into the vaulted roof of the cathedral. The links clattered to an invisible block high above him. He stopped ascending. The stretcher wobbled for a moment and then swung hard to his left, out across the room, drawn with such force it started to rotate. Then the chain began to rattle back up in fits and starts, and the stretcher began hmm. to descend. The a little tiny nub. The corners of the stretcher shuddered there we go. Downward jerk. He began to panic. He strained at the buckled canvas restraints. They wouldn't give, and he didn't want to tear or strain any of his wounds. He came down lower in a series of jolting drops onto some sort of deck area or platform. Men moved in quickly from either side to take hold of the stretcher and steady it. The uplander looked up at their faces and his anxiety transmuted into fear. The men wore robes of simple, poor quality cloth over tight body suits of intricately fashioned brown leather. Each leather suit was constructed in artful panels. Oops. Look out the leg. Some decorated with piercing or knotwork or furrowed lines so that the whole resembled an anatomist's diagram of human muscular. Aha, there it is. The wall of muscle around the ribs, the tendons of the arms, the sinews of the throat. Their faces were animal skulls, masks fashioned from bone, stub horns curled from discolored skull brows. Branching antler tines rose from unicorn's center burrs. The eyes staring out of the mask slits at the uplander were inhuman. They were the black pinned yellow eyes of wolves. They shone with their own light. Get off me, he shouted. But his voice was dust dry in his throat, as though he hadn't spoken for centuries. He coughed, panic rising in his chest. The bone faces crowded in around him puzzled at his antics. All of them smiled the simpleton smile of skulls, the idiot grin of death's face. But the eyes in the sockets and slits put the lie to that gleam. The fire in the yellow eyes was predatory, a fierce intellect, an intent to do harm. Get away from me, he cried, finding his voice at last, dragging it out, old and rusty, from the parched creek bed of his throat. Get back! skulls did nothing of the kind. They came closer. Hands sheathed in intricate brown leather gauntlets reached towards his face to clamp his mouth. Some of them had only two or three fingers. Some had dew claws. The uplander began to thrash in his restraints, 
pulling and twisting in a frenzied effort born of panic. He no longer cared if he tore sutures, or reopened a healing gash, or jarred a mending bone fracture. Something broke. He felt it snap, thought it was a rib or a hamstring, braced himself for the searing pain. It was the canvas cuff on his right arm. He'd torn it clean off the metal boss that anchored it to the stretcher's frame. He lashed out with his freed arm and felt his knuckles connect with the hard ridges of a skull mask. Something let out a guttural bark of distress. The uplander punched again, yelling, then he scrabbled at the buckles girthed around his throat and undid the neck straps. With his throat free, he could lift his shoulders off the hard bed of the stretcher and raise his head clear of the leather brace that was preventing all lateral movement. He bent up, leaning over to unfasten the canvas cuff holding his left wrist. The right hand strap was still buckled around his right forearm with a frayed tuck sprouting from its underside where he'd torn it off the steel boss. The skulls came at him, grabbing him and trying to press him back down. Unbraced, the stretcher swung wildly. The uplander fought them off. His legs were still strapped in. He punched and twisted and cursed at them in low Gothic, Turkic, Croat, and Siblemic. They gibbered at him in commotion, trying to pin him and restrain him. The uplander's right leg came free. He bent it and then lashed out a kick with as much force as he could muster. He caught one of the skulls full in the chest and rejoiced to see the figure recoil with enough violence to tumble at least another two of its rogue companions backwards. Then his left leg tore free too. As his weight shifted suddenly, the stretcher tipped and he spilled off, falling into half a dozen of the skulls. Oh, oh. Hello. Hello. Why are you moving? The uplander had never been taught to fight, and he'd never had to. But terror and a frantic survival instinct impelled him. And they didn't appear to be any huge mystery to him. It was odd. I'm not really sure what caused my camera to move, but okay. The things jerked backwards. They uttered growls of pain or barks of breath. If you were lucky... I think I'm going to put you on a new mount. The uplander milled his arms like a madman. He kicked out. He drove them back. He kicked one of them so hard that it sprawled and broke its skull mask against the smooth granite of the platform. Yeah. The uplander found his feet. The skulls were certain him, but they had become wary. Some of them had been bruised by his slugging fists. He snarled at them, stamping his feet and gesticulating wildly with his fists, as though he was trying to scare off a flock of birds. Oh, there we go. The skulls drew back a little. The uplander took a second to get his bearings. He was standing on a platform of dark granite, a shelf that had been cut, sharp and square-edged, from the rock around it. Behind him, the stretcher was swinging on its chains. To his left, a row of oblong granite blocks lined one side of the platform, permanent catafalques onto which stretchers like his own could be lowered and rested. Above him dangled four or five more chain pulleys of various gauges and sizes. To his right, the platform overhung a gulf. It went straight down into darkness and smelled of wet minerals and the center of the world. The gulf was a shaft, rectangular in cross section, and the sides of the shaft had been cut like Let's see how deep am I out of the living rock. Deep enough, good. The shaft dropped into the Now's the other one. Oblong bites, like the layers of a cake or the cubic yeah, for anyone who wasn't following my uh, earlier or my stream from yesterday. What I am doing right now is drilling out spaces for magnets in the feet. So that way, I can take the model off the base. Oops. Let me actually do this so you guys can see it. I can remove the model from the base. Easier to paint and transport. But since this is fairly dense plastic, I don't want to just... You know, jam in there with a three millimeter drill bit. I'm probably gonna ruin the model if I try to do that. So I start out with a half millimeter thick drill bit and work my way up to the three millimeter drill bit. From the sheer tonnage of rock alone, the square cut bites showed how huge and unwieldy each removed block of stone must have been. The cubic hmm. mass of a mountain had been hollowed out of the heart of a bigger mountain. The platform and the shaft top were lit by the frosty green twilight. Watermarks streaked the horizontally scored stratified walls, leaving down strokes of emerald minerals and algae stain. The uplander could not see how far up the ceiling was because it was lost in the cavity's darkness. He edged backwards, the skulls around him. 
he became conscious of the way that every sound they made became a deep bell echo in the vast chamber. He tried to move to keep the catapults between him and the skulls. They circled in between the beers, trying to outflank him. He noticed that although they looked solid hewn, the catafalques had metal plates set in their sides. The plates incorporated vent caps, indicator lights, and recognizably Terran control pads. Stout, reinforced metal ducting sprouted like drain pipes from the plates and disappeared flush into the platform. There was tech in this primordially quarried chamber. A lot of tech. So that was the half millimeter drill bit. Now a one millimeter drill bit. Attempted to rush him. The uplander darted backwards and reached the pendulating stretcher. He grabbed its metal frame and steered it at the skulls, ramming it at them. They jumped back out of its way and he rammed it again to keep them at bay. He saw the buckled canvas cups anchored to the stretcher's bed. He had assumed he'd simply pulled them all off their pins like the right hand cup. Was yeah, deep enough. Yeah. Forearm. But both leg straps and the left hand cuff had been ripped. The waxed canvas and leather trusses had torn open along their stitching. He'd as good as wrenched himself free of his bonds. The thought disturbed him. Good. Now I get to the three millimeter drill bit. He was whole. His feet were bare. They were pink and clean. The still buckled canvas cuff hung around his right wrist. His body was cased in a dark grey body glove with reinforced panels at the major joints, like the undersuit of some void armor. It was tight and form-fitting. It revealed a figure that looked remarkably lean and strong with surprising muscle definition. It did not look like the well-worn, overtaxed, 83-year-old body he had last looked down at. No thickness. Okay. No I thought I disabled that recipe for that light. No Sorry, one of my smart lights is evidently trying to be a smart ass. Sensing his sudden disconcertion, the skulls came at him. He swung the stretcher into them with all the force he could muster. Its metal nose caught one in the breastbone and almost flipped it onto its back. He glimpsed a cracked dog skull mask, strap broken, sliding away across the platform. Another skull grabbed the opposite end of the stretcher and tried to wrench it out of his hands. The uplander uttered a despairing, denying cry that echoed around the vast chamber and hauled the stretcher out of the skull's grip. The skull there we go, so now I got holes in the feet. The uplander pulled the stretcher right back and let it fly. It swung like a wrecking ball. It struck one skull down and slammed into a second, knocking it off the edge of the platform into the gulf. The skull managed to catch the lip of the platform as it went over. Its hands clawed frantically at the granite surfaces. The weight of its legs and body slid it backwards. The other skulls rushed forwards and grabbed it by the hands and sleeves. While they were occupied pulling their kin to safety, the upland ran. He left the chamber, his bare feet slapping against the cool stone floor. He passed under a broad lintel and down the throat of an entrance hall big enough to fly a cargo spinner through. The permeating green dusk See, I just slide the magnet right on, right onto the blade, pop it into the space with a little bit of super glue in there to hold it in place. were more finished than the vast chamber behind him. The rock walls had been planed or polished to a dull shine, like dark water ice in the middle of a hard winter. There we go. The stone, the ceiling, and the edges of the floor where it met the wall. Along with the interspersed archways, a little bit of zip kicker to make sure the glue is set. Were dressed in beams and fittings of gleaming off white, like varnished blonde wood. Most of the white wood finishings were massive, as thick as tree boles. Now, a nice little trick to get to line up with the model. Hmm, as sure as that camera is not where it's supposed to be. There we go. Made memories higher in his head, sudden and sharp. The halls reminded him of icon caskets he had once recovered. From atomic bunkers under the anyway, as I was saying, a nice trick I found to be able to line up the magnets is once you have the magnets in the feet of the model, stick the next two magnets on the magnets so that way they're held in place. Position the model where you want on the base. They reminded him of the 
ones made of grey slate set into frames of expertly worked iron. Oh, that didn't work too well. Yes, that was I think it. I need to get a new marker. Sheets, hammered around carcasses of wood and pin screwed bone. So old, so precious. The white posts and pillars finishing his surroundings looked like they were made of bone. They had an unmistakable, slightly golden cast. A warmth. He felt as if he were inside there we go. a slate lying with ivory. As if he were the ancient treasure. And then just like before. The lock of saintly hair, the flaking parchment. Start with the small drill bit. He kept running, straining to hear whether he was being followed. The only sounds were the slaps of his souls and the faraway sigh of wind gusting along empty hallways. The draft made it feel as though he were in some high castle where a casement shutter had been left open somewhere, allowing air to stir through unpopulated chambers. He stopped for a moment. Turning to his left, he could feel the breath of the wind against his face, a faint, positive pressure from one direction. Then he heard something else. A ticking sound. A clicking. He couldn't tell where it was coming from. It was ticking like a clock, but faster, like an urgent heartbeat. He slowly made sense of what he was hearing. Something was padding along the stone floor of the tunnel somewhere close by. A quadruped. Soft-footed, moving with purpose, but not running. It had claws, not the retractable claws of a feline, but the claws of a dog, prominent and unconcealed. The wear blunted tips, tap-tap-tapping on the stone floor with every step. He was being stalked. He was being hunted. He started to run again. A tunnel brought mm. out under a fine, spandrelled arch of blonde wood, and revealed a great flight of stairs up ahead. The steps were cut from the native rock, square and plain. They became winders after the first ten steps, where the flight turned away. The depth of the tread and the height of the risers were two or three times the normal dimensions. It was a giant staircase. He heard the claw clicks closing in behind him and began to bound up the steps. The lustrous green twilight threw strange shadows. His own shadow loomed alarmingly at his side, staining the wall like the therianthropic shapes in his dream cave. His shadow head looked more like an animal's on the curving wall, so much so that he had to stop for a moment and feel at his face to check that he had not woken in possession of a snout or muzzle. His fingers found the lean flesh of his face, human and familiar, with a trace of moustache and a patch of beard on the chin. Then he realized he could only see out of one eye. The last breathing memory he had was a bear taking his right eye out with his fingers. The pain had been dull, but enough to shock him into unconsciousness. Yet it was his right eye he could see out of. It was his right eye that was showing him the frosty green twilight around him. His left eye registered only blackness. The claw taps approached behind him, louder, nearly at the bullnose step of the foot of the flight. He resumed his escape. Looking down, he watched the shadows on the winding steps move and alter behind him. The edge step shadows fanned out into a radiating geometric diagram, like the delicate compartments of a giant spiral seashell or the partition divisions of some intricate brass astrolabe or timepiece. Tick, tick, tick. Each second, each step, each stair, each turn, each division. A new shadow loomed below him. It spread up across the outside wall of the giant staircase, cast by something on the stairs, but out of sight around the turn. It was canine. Its head was down, and its ears were forward and alert. Its back, thickly furred, was arched and tensed. Its forepaws rose and took each step with mesmeric precision and grace. The ticking had slowed down. I'm not afraid of you, he <laughs> cried. There are no wolves on Fenris. Yeah, because that'll make a huge difference when a wolf is eating you. I don't believe you're here, therefore you can't hurt me. You're right. And he tripped and fell hard. Something seized him from behind, something powerful. He cried out, imagining jaws closing on his back. A tight grip rolled him onto his back on the steps. There was a giant standing over him. But it was a man, not a wolf. The face was all he saw. 
It was sheathed in a tight mask of lacquered brown leather, part man, part demon wolf, as intricately made as the body suits of the skulls. Knotted and straight, the leather pieces circled the eye sockets and made heavy lids. They barred the cheek like exposed sinew and buffered the chin. They wrapped the throat and were shaped to mimic a long moustache and a bound up tusk. There we go. One set of legs down. Through the mask slits with a color of spun gold with black. See, this one's going to be a bit easier because there's only one foot touching the ground. So I'm going to just put that wherever I want on the base. But I'm probably going to put it right about there. I don't understand, the Uplander quailed. What are you called? The giant asked. Some shred of wit remained in the Uplander's head. Ahmad Ibn Rustar. The giant grasped him by the upper arm and dragged him the rest of the way up the stairs. The uplander scrambled to keep up, his feet slipping and milling, like a child pulled along by an adult. <laughs> the giant had a lush black pelt around one shoulder, and his immense corded physique was packed into a leatherwork body glove. The build, the scope of the giant's physicality, was unmistakable. Your Astartes, the uplander ventured, half running, half slithering in response to the dragging grip. What? Astartes, I said you're... Of course I'm Astartes, the giant rumbled. Do you have a name? Of course I have a name. W w what is it? It's shut up or I'll slit your bloody throat. That's what it is, all right. <laughs> Very space wolfy. The doorway of a massive but low ceiling chamber. The uplander felt heat, the warmth of flame. Vision was suddenly, curiously, returning to his dead left eye. He could see a dull, fiery glow ahead. It was enough to catch the shape of things in the dark, the shape of things his right eye saw in hard, cold, green relief. The giant dragged him in through the stone archway. The chamber was circular, at least 30 meters across. The floor was a great disk of polished bone or pale wood, laid in almost seamless sections. There were three plinths in the room, each one a broad, circular platform. Not ah, quite deep enough. Rising about a meter off the bone floor. Each plinth was simply cut and worked smooth. In the center of each was a fire pit, crackling with well fed flames, oozing a blush of heat into the air. Hey, Stephanie, I have five custodes. I'm going to try and get all five of the legs done tonight. Through his right eye, the chamber was a bright place of spectral green light. The licking flames were blooming white in their brightness. Hmm. To his left, it was a dark, ruddy cave. Suffused by an uneven golden glow from the fires. That's deep enough. The expanse of bone floor and brushed pale stone reflected the firelight's radiance. Opposite the chamber door, where the low wall met the down curved edge of the dome roof, there were shallow horizontal window slits, like the ports of a gun emplacement. The depth of the angled recesses around the slits spoke of the extraordinary thickness of the walls. Four men occupied the room, all seated on the flat top. The furthest plinth. All of them were giants in furs and leather, like the one who clasped his arm. They were relaxed, sipping from silver drinking bowls, playing. What did you do? Counters on wooden boards laid out on the plinth between them. It looked like one of the men, cross legged and nearest the fire pit, was playing all of the other three, simultaneously running three boards. They looked from their games, four more demon faces cased in tight leather masks. Four more sets of yellow eyes catching the lamplight like mirrors. The flash oh. brightest in the green. And yeah, yeah, news. Uh, mount for this camera. This one is dying. I actually didn't know mounts could die. I found Ahmed Ibn Rushtar on the chapter stairs, is what I found, replied the giant holding him. Two of the men by the fire snorted, and one tapped a finger to his crown to imply a touch of simple mindedness. And what's at Ahmed Ibn Rustar then? asked the first one again. The pelt he was wearing was red brown, and his hair, long and braided stiff with wax or lacquer, projected out of the back of his full head mask in an S curve, like a striking serpent. Don't you remember? the giant replied. Don't you remember, Va? The giant let go of the uplander's arm and shoved him down onto the bone floor until he was kneeling. The floor was warm to the touch. 
I remember you talking shit yesterday, Trunk. Return bar. I showed restraint, but one of the guys at the game store started making some unfavorable jokes about transgendered people. Yes, bite my hairy arm. Uh, the men lounging on the plinth burst out laughing, all except the one sitting cross legged. I remember. Were any of them at least a version that I haven't heard before? His mask was the most intricate of all. The cheeks and brow were seething with interlocking figures and spiraling ribbon shapes. His wide shoulders were draped with two pelts, one coal black, the other white. Yes, and you'd remember him too, Varangar, if you only thought about it for a bloody minute. I mm. would, asked Bard of the Serpent Crest uncertainly. Yes, you would. Alright, so when you say you showed restraint, what does that actually equate to? Remember now? Bar nodded. The crest of bound hair went up and down like the arm of a hand pump. Oh, yes, Garcy. I do, I do. Good, said the man in the black and white coat, and casually fetched Bar an open handed flipper on the side of the head that seemed to deliver the same playful force of a mallet seating a fence post. I recognize my failing and will be sure to correct it. Bar mumbled. The man in the black and white pelts uncrossed his legs, slipped to the edge of the plinth, and stood up. What do we do with him, Scarcy? Trunk asked. Well, the man said, I suppose we could eat him. He stared down at the kneeling uplander. That was a joke, he said. I don't think he's laughing, Scarcy, said one of the others. The man in the black and white pelt aimed an index finger at Trunk. You go down and find out why he's awake. Yes, Scarcy, Trunk nodded. Scarcy turned the finger towards Varanga. <laughs> Va, you go and find the Gothi. Bring him here. He'll know what's to be done. Va nodded his serpent crest again. Scarcy pointed at the other two men. You two go and just go. We'll finish the game circle later. The two men got off the plinth and followed Var and Trunk towards the chamber door. Just because you were losing, Scarcy, laughed one of them as he went by. You look pretty funny with a niftiful board jammed up your ass, Scarcy replied. The men laughed again. When the four of them had passed through the arched doorway and out of sight, Scarcy turned back to the uplander and hunkered down to face him with his hands clasped and his elbows resting on his knees. He cocked his huge masked head on one side, studying the man kneeling on the floor in front of him. So, you're Ibn Rusta, then? The uplander didn't reply at first. You got a voice in you? Scarcy asked. Or is it just the words I'm using? He tapped hmm. the lips of his tight leather mask. Words? Yes. You need a translator? A translator? I don't like how loose that is. Chest, ...and then remembered that his environment suit was long gone. I've lost my translator unit, he replied. I don't know where it went, but I understand you. I'm not sure how. What are you speaking? Scarcy shrugged. Words. What language? Uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, effort, seeing as I'm going to try and put two I magnets in one foot. Is it any better? Did you switch just then? asked the uplander. Between you, Vic, and Low? Yes. The uplander shook his head, slightly mystified. Okay, so I see where you would have had a hit. Uh, where would the and run have come from? Just the same. You know you're speaking you, Vic, back to me, don't you? Scarcy said. The uplander hesitated. He swallowed. I couldn't speak you, Vic, yesterday, he confessed. That's what a good night's sleep will do for you, said Scarcy. He rose. Get up and come and sit over here, he said, pointing at the plinth where the four Astartes had been gaming. The uplander got up and followed him. You're space wolves, aren't you? Scarcy found that amusing. Oh, now those words aren't you, Rick. Oh, space sorry, I misread what you said before. <laughs> we don't use that term. What do you use them? I thought you said you had almost had a hit and run. If we're being formal. 
just the route. Otherwise, he beckoned the uplander to sit on the broad stone plinth, sliding one of the wooden game boards out of his way. In the fire pit, kindling spat and cracked, and the uplander could feel the fierce press of heat against his left side. Your Scarcy, he asked. Your name? Scarcy nodded, taking a sip of dark liquid from a silver bowl. That's so. Amlo de Scarson Scarsonson, Jarl of Fife. You're some kind of lord. Yes, some kind. Scarcy oh, flat, smile, flat, there is flat. What does Jarl of Fife mean then? What language is that? Scarcy picked up one of the bone disc counters from the game boards and started to play with it absent mindedly. It's Worgen. Worgen? You ask a lot of questions. I do, said the uplander. It's what I do. It's why I came here. Scarcy nodded. He flipped the counter back onto the board. It's why you came here, eh? To ask questions? I can think of plenty of better reasons for going to a place. He looked at the uplander. And where is here, Ahmad ibn Rusta? Fenris. The fortress of the Sixth Legion Astartes, called... Forgive me, the Space Wolves. The fortress is known as the Fang. Am I right? Yes. Except only an idiot calls it the Fang. What does a man call it if he isn't an idiot? The Uplander asked. The Eye, said Scus. Well, there we go. The Two magnets and one foot. Just the Eye? Yes. Literally, clan home or fireplace or... Den. Yes, yes, yes. Am I annoying you with my questions, Amlodi Skarsen Skarsenson? Skarsi grunted. You are. The uplander nodded. <laughs> Useful to know. Why? asked Skarsi. Because if I'm going to be here, and I'm going to ask my questions, I'd best be aware of how many I can get away with at a time. I wouldn't want to piss the Vilka Fenrika off so much they decide to eat me. Skarsi shrugged and crossed his legs. No one's going to eat you for that, he said. I know, I was joking, said the uplander. I wasn't, replied Scarcy. <laughs> You're under Ogvai's protection, so only he can decide who gets to eat you. The uplander paused. Ah, Space Wolf logistics and legalities. You gotta love it. He swallowed. The Vilka Fenrika, they're capable of cannibalism then, are they? We're capable of anything, replied Scarcy. That's the whole point of us. The uplander slid off the plinth and stood up. He wasn't sure if he was moving away from the Astartes' lord or the disagreeable heat. He just wanted to move away, to walk around. So who... So who's this Ogvai who has power over my life? Scarcy took another sip from his bowl. Ogvai, Ogvai Helmskrot, Jarl of Tra. Earlier, I heard you say someone called Gedraf was Jarl of Tra. He was, said Scarcy. Gedraf's sleeping on the red snow now, so Og's Jarl. But Og has to honor any of Gedraf's decisions, like bringing you here under protection. The uplander moved around the room, his arms folded against his chest. So, Jarl, that's Lord, we've established. Well, that's part of why I do these stream stuff. To encourage discussion, talk, and ideas. I also tend to lurk in several other streams. So, your Lord of Five, and this Ogvai is. And of course, you know how uh, how much I uh, tend to go on the forums and the Facebook groups and project sites. Companies. We call them companies. And that's in Hwurgen? Yes, Hwurgen. Juvik is Harfkant. Hwurgen is Warkant. A specialized combat language, a battle tongue. Skarsi waved his hand in a distracted manner. Whatever you want to call it. You have a language for fighting and a language for when you're not fighting. Fenris Holder, the questions never end. <laughs> There's always something else to know, said the uplander. There's always more to know. Not true. There's such a thing as too much. 
This last comment had been made by a new voice. Another Astartes had entered the chamber behind the Uplander, silent as the There we go, smoke. that's more secure now. Yeah. The newcomer had the stature of all of his breed, and was dressed in a knotwork leather suit like the others the Uplander had encountered. But he was not masked. His head was shaved, apart from a stiffly waxed and braided beard that curled like a horn from his chin. There was a cap of soft leather on his scalp, and a faded tracery of tattooed lines and dots on the weather-beaten flesh of his face. In common with all of the Vilka Fenrika the Uplander had seen, the newcomer's eyes were black-centered gold, and his lean, craggy face was noticeably elongated around the nose and mouth, as if he had the hint of a snout. When he opened his mouth to speak, the Uplander saw what the extended jaw was made to conceal. The newcomer's dentition resembled that of a mature forest wolf. The canines in particular were the longest the Uplander had seen. There's such a thing as too much, the newcomer repeated. Exactly, Scarcy exclaimed, getting up. Too much, that's exactly what I was saying. You explain it oh, to him. Oh, bullcrap, Scarcy. Better still, you try answering his endless questions. If I can, said the newcomer. He gazed at the Uplander. What is the next question? The Uplander tried to return the stare without flinching. What did that remark mean? Too much, he asked. Even knowledge has its Now, yeah, well, if you come with any good kings of war unsafe. ideas for orcs, let me know. You can know. Uh, unfortunately, you know as well as I do. I don't play much kings of That's war. That's what I said. I disagree. The newcomer smiled slightly. Actually, oh, beyond its existence, I know nothing of it. Surprised. Do you have a name? The Uplander asked him. We all have names. Some of us have more than one. Mine is Othair Weirdnik. I am rune priest to Amlodi Skarsen Skarsenson. Thank you for the follow, Unleash. Was that Unleash Hell 5? Huh. A shaman. A practitioner of ritual. A rattle of bones. A pagan wizard. You can barely disguise the superior tone in your voice. No, I meant no affront, the uplander said quickly. The priest's lips had curled into an unpleasant snarl. What is your next question? The Uplander hesitated again. How did Gedrath, Jarl of Tra, die? He died the way we all die, said Scarcy, with red snow under him. It must have been sudden, in the last few days. Scarcy looked at the rune priest. It was a time ago, the priest told the Uplander. But Gedrath gave me his protection. And that has passed to Ogvai. Ogvai must have replaced him in the last week. What? Why are you looking at me like that? You are basing your assumption on a false premise, said Othair Weirdmake. Really? asked the Uplander. Yes, said the priest. You've been here for 19 years. <laughs> Little footnote for you. Chapter 4. Scald. They gave Hauser the Prix d'Amal. When he was told of the decision, he felt flattered and nonplussed. I've done nothing, he said to his colleagues. There had been a short list of notable candidates, but in the end, it had come down to Hauser and a neuroplasticist who had eradicated the three strands of nano-mnemonic plague devastating Iberio-Latinate Sudmerica. He's done something, a considerable something, and I've done nothing. Thank you for the hose, Shrunken Terra. Don't you want the prize? Vasily asked. I hear the medal is very pretty. It was very pretty. It was gold, about the size of a pocket watch, and it came mounted in a vitrian frame in an elegant casket lined with shot purple silk. The citation bore the hololithic crests of the Atlantic legislature and the hegemon, and carried the gene seals of three members of the Unification Council. It began, Kaspar Ansbach Hauser for steadfast contributions towards the definition and accomplishment of Terran unification. Soon after the presentation, Hauser learned that the whole thing was politicking, which he generally detested, though he did not speak up as the politicking in this instance served the cause of the conservatory. The award was presented at a dinner held in Kharkom on the Atlantic platforms just after the midsummer of Hauser's 75th year. 
I know, but the only games going on in my local store is War Machine, Kings of War. Some of the guys are looking to get into Wrath of Kings, and then the Rare Empire of the Dead game. And only two of those games I actually know anything about. And a sick smile on his face, waiting for the interminable speeches to conclude. Of the many dignitaries and men of influence attending the dinner that midsummer night, no one was paid more deference than Gyro Emmentine. By then, Emmentine was prefect secretary to one of the Unification Council's most senior members, and the common understanding was that Emmentine would be given the next seat that came vacant. He was an old man, rumored to be on his third juvenile. He was accompanied by a remarkably young, remarkably beautiful, and remarkably silent woman. Hauser couldn't decide if she was Emmentine's daughter, a vulgar trophy wife, or a nurse. Emmentine's status placed him directly at the right hand of the Atlantic Chancellor, though nominally the guest of honor, Hauser was three seats down to the left, between an industrial cyberneticist and the chairman of one of the orbital banking houses. When it was Emmentine's turn to speak, he appeared to have great difficulty in remembering who Hauser was, because he spoke fondly of their long relationship and close working association down the many years since Cass first spoke to me about the notion of founding the conservatory. I've met him three times in thirty years, Hauser whispered to Vasily. Shut up and keep smiling, Vasily hissed back. None of this actually occurred. Shut up. Do you suppose he's on some kind of strong medication? Oh, Cass, shut up! <laughs> Vasily bent close to Hauser's ear. This is just the way things are done. Besides, it makes the conservatory look good. Oh, and his adjunct has informed me that he'll want to see you afterwards. After the dinner, Vasily escorted Hauser up to the Chancellor's residence on Mariana Steric. It's a beautiful city, Hauser remarked as they walked up the terrace. He had drunk a couple of anisecs at the end of the meal to settle himself for the acceptance speech, and then there had been the toasting, so he was in a wistful mood. <laughs> Vasily waited patiently for a moment as Hauser stopped to admire the view. From the terrace, they could see out across the plated scape of Carcon and beyond. It glittered in the late sun, the surface of a metropolitan skin nine kilometres thick that capped and encased the ancient dead ocean like an ice pack. Shoals of aircraft silver in the sunlight like reef fish flitted and drifted over the scape. Amazing enough that man could build this, said Hauser, let alone build it three times. Man probably shouldn't have kept nuking it then, should he? said Vasily. Hauser looked at his mediary. Vasily was terribly young, little more than twenty-five. Isaac Vasily, you have no soul, he pronounced. Ah, but that's why you hired me, Vasily replied. I don't let sentiment get in the way of efficiency. There is that. Besides, to me, the very fact that the Atlantic platforms have been obliterated and rebuilt twice is symbolic of the conservatory's work. Nothing is so great that it cannot be recovered and restored. Nothing is impossible. They went into the residence. Ridiculously ornate robotic servitors imported from Mars were attending the select group of guests. The Chancellor had commissioned the machines directly from the Mondus Gamma Forge of Lucas Crom, an ostentatious show of status. The windows of the residence had been dimmed against the glare of the setting sun. A pair of servitors in the shape of hummingbirds brought Hauser a glass of Amasek. Drink it slowly, Vasily advised discreetly. When you speak to Emmentine, you need to be coherent. I doubt I'll drink it at all, Hauser said. He'd taken a sip. The Amasek served by the Atlantic Chancellor was of such a fine and extravagantly expensive vintage, it didn't really taste like Amasek anymore. Emmentine approached after a few minutes, his silent female companion in tow. He shared his previous conversational partners behind him like a snake, sloughing skin. They knew when their brief allotted audience... Wow, that is always an image that done. never fails to get Jasper, me. Emmentine said. Sir, congratulations on the prize. A worthy award. Uh, thank you, I... Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my mediary, Isaac Vasily. Emmentine did not register anyone as lowly as Vasily. Hauser felt the prefect secretary was only registering him because he had to. Emmentine drew Hauser away towards the windows. Thirty years, Emmentine said. Can it really be thirty years since all this began? Hauser assumed the prefect secretary meant the conservatory. Nearly fifty, actually. 
Really? We measure the life of the conservatory from its first charter, the Conclave of Lutetia, which was 30 years ago this summer. But it took nearly 20 years to get the movement to that place. It must be 50 years ago I first contacted your office to discuss the very basic first steps. That would have been in Karelia, Karelia Hive. You were with the legation back then, and I dealt for a long time with several of your understaffers. I had a dialogue with them for a number of years, actually, before I met you for the first time, and... Fifty years, eh? My, my. Karelia, you say? <laughs> Another life. Yes, it feels like that, doesn't it? So, yes, I worked with a number of adjuncts to get some awareness. Made a bit of a nuisance of myself, I'm sure. Doling was one. Barants, I remember. Bakunin. I don't remember them, the Prefect Secretary said. His smile had become rather fixed. Hauser took a sip of his anisek. He felt slightly invigorated, slightly warm. He'd become fixated upon Emmetine's hand, which was holding a crystal thimble of some green digestive. The hand was perfect. It was clean and manicured, scented, graceful. The skin was white and unblemished and uncreased, and the flesh plump and supple. There were no signs at all of the consequences of age. No wrinkles, no liver spots, no discolorations. The nails were clean. It wasn't the gnarled, sunken, prominently veined claw of a 190-year-old man, and Prefect Secretary Gyro Emmentine was at least that. It was the hand of a young man. Hauser wondered if the young man was missing it. The thought made him snigger. Of course, the Prefect Secretary had access to the best juvenile refinements Terran science could offer. The treatments were so good, they didn't even look like juvenile treatments. Not like the work Hauser had had done at 60, plumping his flesh with collagenics and filling his creases and wrinkles with dermics and perma-staining his skin a healthy tanned colour with nanotic pigments and cleaning his eyes and his organs and re-sculpting his chin and pinching his cheeks until he looked like a retouched hololith portrait of himself. Emmentine probably had gene therapies and skeletomuscular grafts, implants, underweaves, transfixes, stem splices. Maybe it was a young man's hand. Maybe the skin weaves or why the prefect secretary's smile looked so fixed. You don't remember Doling or Bakunin? Hauser asked. They were understaffers, you say? <laughs> it was a long time ago, Emmentine replied. They've all climbed the ladders of advancement, been posted and promoted and transferred. One doesn't keep track. One can't. Not when one runs a staff of 80,000. I have no doubt they're all governing their own ecumenopolises by now. There was a slightly awkward pause. Anyway, said Hauser, I should like to thank you for getting behind the idea of the conservatory all those years ago, be it 30 or 50. Yeah, <laughs> said Eventine. I appreciate it, we all do. I can't take the credit, said Eventine. Of course you damn well can't, Hauser thought. But the idea always had merit, Emmentine went on, as if he was content to take the credit anyway. I always said it had merit. Too easily overlooked in a headlong rush to build a better world. Not a priority, some said. The needs, and they are budgetary often, of unification and consolidation far exceed conservation. But we stuck to it. What is it now? 30,000 officers worldwide? That's just direct. It's closer to a quarter of a million, counting freelance associates and archaeologists, and the off-world numbers. Superb, said Emmentine. Hauser continued to stare at his hand. Then, of course, there's the renewal of the Charter, which is never opposed. Everyone now understands the importance of the Conservatory. Not quite everyone, said Hauser. Everyone who matters, Casper. <laughs> you know, the Sigilite himself is keenly interested in the Conservatory's work. I had heard that, Hauser replied. Keenly interested, Emmentine repeated. Every time I meet with him, he asks for the latest transcripts and reports. Do you know him at all? The Sigilite? No, I've never met him. Extraordinary man, said Emmentine. I've heard he even discusses the Conservatory's work with the Emperor on occasion. Really? said Hauser. Do you know him? The Emperor? I love being good at what I do. A slightly glassy expression 
flickered across the prefect secretary's face, as if he wasn't sure if he was being mocked. No, I... I've never met him. Ah. Emmentine nodded at the purple box still clamped under Hauser's arm. You deserve that, Casper, and so does the conservatory. It's part of the recognition we were talking about. It's high profile, and it'll bring around those few closed minds. Bring them around to what? asked Hauser. Well, support. The support is vital, particularly in the current climate. What current climate? You should cherish that award, Casper. Uh, to me, it says that the Conservatory has matured into a global force for unification. And it doesn't hurt at all that your name is forever attached to it by the simple accident that you are at the top of the bureaucratic chain. I first approached, how's a thought? This has done your career no harm, Gyro Emmentine. To recognise the importance of the Conservatory project, to give it your support and backing when others scorned it, why, what a wise humanitarian and selfless man you must be. Not like all those other politicians. The Prefect Secretary was still speaking. So we need to be ready for changes in the next decade, he was saying. Um, changes? The Conservatory has become a victim of its own success. Emmentine laughed. It has. Whether we like it or not, it's time to consider legitimacy. I can't nurse me the Conservatory forever. My future is beckoning in different ways. A Senate shall ship to Luna, or Mars, maybe. A seat on the council, I was told. Emmentau pulled a modest face. Oh, I, I don't know. It's what I heard. The point is, I can't protect you forever, said Emmentine. I wasn't aware the conservatory was being protected at all. Its resource and personal budget has become quite considerable. And is scrupulously policed, of course. But it's the mandate that bothers some. It's having what is essentially a vital organ of government, a key and growing human resource, functioning separately from the hegemonic administration. That's just the way it is, replied Hauser. That's just the way it's evolved. We're transparent and open to all. We're a public office. It might be time to consider bringing the conservatory in under the umbrella of the administration, said Emmentine. It might be better that way. Centralised, which would help with the bureaucratic management and with archiving and access, not to mention funding. We'd become part of the administratum. Really, just for bookkeeping purposes, replied the Prefect Secretary. I, well, I think I'd be a little hesitant. Resistant, in fact. I think we all would. The Prefect Secretary put his digestif down and reached out his hand to clasp it around Hauser's. His young man's fingers enclosed Hauser's grandfather hand. We must all move with a fluid common purpose towards unification. That's what the sigillite says, said Emmentine. The unification of Terra and the Imperium, replied Hauser. Not the literal union of the intellectual branches of mankind, but Dr. Hauser, they may refuse to renew the charter if you resist. You've spent 30 years showing them that the systematic conservation of knowledge is important. Now the feeling is and it's shared by many on the Council, conservation of knowledge is so important, it's time it was conducted by the administration of the hegemony. It needs to be official and sanctioned and central. I see. Over the next few months, I am going to be handing off a lot of responsibilities to my undersecretary, Henrik Susan. Uh, did you meet him earlier? No. I'll see to it you meet him tomorrow at the manufactory visit. Get to know him. He's extremely able, and he'll steward the situation in directions that will reassure you. I see. Good. And once again, congratulations. A deserving winner. Fifty years, eh? My, my. Hauser realised his audience had concluded. <laughs> his glass was empty, too. How can it be so long? he asked as the Astartes took him from the fire pit chamber and out along the dark, breathing halls of the Eight. The wind gusted around them. Away from the firelight, his left eye lost its sight again. You've been asleep, the rune priest replied. You say 19 years, but you mean Fenrisian years, don't you? You mean great years. Yes, that's three, four times as long in Terran years. 
You've been asleep, the rune priest said. The uplander felt lightheaded. The sense of personal dislocation was intense and nauseating. He was mm. afraid he might be sick or pass out, and he was afraid of doing anything so frail in front of the Astartes. He was afraid of the Astartes. The fear added to his sense of personal. Well, yeah, who wouldn't be afraid of uh, space wolves? There were three. I'm sorry, Vilka Fenrika Astartes. The rune priest, Varangor, and another whose name the Uplander did not know. The Scarcy had shown no particular interest in coming with them. He had turned back to his playing boards, as though the Uplander was a mild diversion that was now finished with. And more important things, like bone counter discs on an inlaid board, had become more significant. As they walked, the Astartes directed him with the occasional tap on the shoulder to turn him left and right. They walked him through great rock crypts and chambers of basalt, sulking voids of granite, and mournful hollowed halls panelled in bone. He saw all of these places through the green glare of his right eye, with only impenetrable darkness in his left. All of them were empty, except for the plaintive lament of the respiring wind. They were like tombs, tombs waiting to be filled, great sepulchres carved out in the expectation of an immense death toll, in anticipation of the corpses of a million warriors carried in on their shields and laid to rest. A million, a million million, legions of the fallen. The wind was just rehearsing for its role as chief mourner. Where are we going? The uplander asked. To see the priests, said Barangur. But you're a priest, the uplander said to Othair, half turning. Barangur gave him a little push to encourage him forwards. Different priests, said Barangur. The other kind. What other kind? You know the other kind, said the nameless Astartes. I don't know. I don't understand, said the uplander. I don't understand, and I'm cold. Cold, echoed Varangar. He shouldn't feel the cold, not where he's been. It's a good sign, said the other. Yeah, it means you have working if nerves, felt, said the rune priest. Do what, retorted Varangar. Give him a pelt, the rune priest repeated. Give him my pelt? Varanga asked, looking down at the red-brown skin around his shoulders. The S-curve of his lacquered hair rose like a spear-casting arm as his chin dipped. But it's my pelt. The other Astartes snorted and pulled off his own fur, a grey wolf skin. He held it out to the uplander. Here, he said. Take it. A gift from Bittel Burkor to Ahmad ibn Rustar. Is this some kind of compact? The uplander asked warily. He didn't want to accidentally become beholden to a wolf Astartes on top of everything else. Burkor shook his head. No, not anything with blood mixed in it. Maybe when you tell my account, you'll remember this kindness and make it part of the story. When I tell your account? Burkor nodded. Yes, because you will. When you tell it, you make me look good, sharing the pelt with you. And you make Va look like a selfish hog. The uplander looked at Varangar. His eyes shone like lamps in the frosty dark. He looked as if he was going to strike Burkhor. Then he saw the rune priest watching him. He sagged a little. I recognize my failing and will be sure to correct it, he mumbled. <laughs> the uplander pulled Burkhor's gift around his shoulders. He looked up at Othair Weirdmake. I still don't understand. I know said the priest. No, no, the uplander replied in frustration. This is where you reassure me. This is where you tell me that everything will be explained. But I can't, replied the priest, because it won't. Some things will be explained, enough things probably, but not everything, because explaining everything is never a good idea. They arrived at the drop. The long, drafty hall came to an end, and they were standing on the lip of a great cliff. A chasm plunged away beneath them, dropping sheer into total darkness. On the far side of the great drop, the uplander could see the ghost-green ragged wall of the shaft. The sepulchral hall had brought them to an enormous flume, rising vertically through the rock in the heart of the mountain. The shaft vanished into darkness high above them. The winter gale gusted up from far below. Which way now? asked the uplander. Varanger gripped him firmly by the upper arm. Down, he said, and he stepped off the cliff and took the uplander with him.
He was too shocked to scream out the terror that exploded his chest and burst his brain. They fell, they fell, they fell. But not hard, and not to their depths. They fell softly, like flecks of down from a torn sleeping roll, caught by the breeze, like papery flecks of ash, like a pair of hummingbird servitors, defying gravity with wings so fast, they seemed still. The wind of Fenris was everywhere inside the Ite, gusting in halls, breathing through crypts and vaults and chambers, but in the great vertical flue, it blew with enough upward force to catch falling objects and cushion their descent. The rising gale lowered them slowly, dragging against their flapping pelts and flapping the beads and straps of the Astartes. Barangur stuck out an arm, the one that wasn't gripping the uplander's limp frame. He stuck it out like an eagle's wing into the updraft and steered them. He turned them slowly at an angle in the fierce blast. The uplander's tearshot eyes, blinking furiously in the wind and out of gutting fear, saw another cliff lip below, another shelf opening into the flue. They came into it at a perfect angle. Barangar landed on his feet and turned the landing into a couple of quick steps that bled off his speed. The uplander's feet scrambled and kicked, and he fell on his face. The pelt flopped forwards over his head, like a hood. You'll learn the knack, said Barangar. How, said the uplander. By doing it more, replied the Astartes. On his hands and knees, the uplander convulsed violently and wretched. Nothing but spittle and mucus came up out of a gut that had been empty for 19 years, but his body wrenched and wrung itself in a brutal effort to find something. Burkor and the rune priest landed on the lip behind them. Pick him up, said the priest. They carried him forwards, away from the cliff edge. His head lolled, but his left eye woke up. He saw a chamber up ahead well lit with biolumin lamps and electric filaments in glass tubes. The sudden illumination was painful. He had a hot orange version of the scene in his left eye, full of fire shadows, and the warm yellow glow of tube lights and ivory flooring. In the other eye, the scene was an incandescent green, violently bright. The lamps and other light sources were so intense to his right eye, they had almost scorched out of vision entirely and become white hot spots and after image blooms. There were very few shadows in his right eye, and the focus was shot. The Astartes put him down. The uplander could smell blood, salt water, and the bleachy reek of counterseptic. The chamber was either a medical facility or an abattoir. Or perhaps it was both, or had been one and was now the other. There was also a hint of a laboratory and a smack of kitchen. There were metal benches and adjustable cots. There were clusters of overhead focus lights and branches of automated servitor arms and manipulators sprouting from the ceiling like willow trees. There were stone slabs like butcher blocks or altars. Hidden machinery hummed and whirred, and electronic notes sounded a constant background chorus like a digital rainforest. Archways led through to other kitchen morgues. The complex was vast. He glimpsed the frosty doors of cryogenic units and the glass-lidded tanks of organic repair vats. Library shelves stretched off into the distance, lined with heavy glass bottles and canisters, like giant jars of pickled and preserved fruit in a winter root cellar. But the flasks did not contain vegetables or rad apples in their dark, syrupy suspensions, and they were slotted into the shelves to connect with the facility's vital support system. Horned skulls appeared, robed men with animal skull heads like the ones who had surrounded him when he first woke up. The rune priest sensed his alarm. They are just thralls, servants and grooms. They will not hurt you. Other figures appeared from invisible corners of the rambling laboratory. These were Astartes from the Bilderfam, horned skulls of significantly greater scale and threat than the ones worn by the thralls covered their faces. Their robes were floor length and had a quilted look stitched together from sections of soft, napped leather. When they reached out their hands to greet or grasp the uplander, he saw that their hands were covered in gloves patched together from the same material, and that the gloves were sewn into the enveloping cloaks as if they were inside patchwork bags of skin with integral glove extensions that allowed them to work. The stitching on the patchwork seams, though expertly neat, reminded the uplander far too much of surgical sutures. They were sinister figures, and their presence was not helped 
by the fact that oath their weird make showed deference to them. Who are you? the Uplander asked. They are the wolf priests, said Othair, softly at his shoulder. The gene weavers, the flesh makers, they will examine you. Why? To make sure you're healthy, to check their workmanship. The Uplander shot a quick glance at the rune priest. Their what? You came to the Eight broken and old, Amadib and Rustar, said one of the wolf priests in a voice that creaked like flow ice. Too broken to live? And too old to heal. The only way to save you was to remake you. One of the horned giants took his right hand, another his left. He let them lead him into the slaughterhouse chapel like parents leading a child. He took off the pelt and settled on the black glass bed of a body scanner. There were a lot of wolf priests around him now, shamanic shadows with feral horns and guttural voices. Some were intent on adjusting the backlit wall plates of the control panels. Others were occupied with the elaborate tapping and shaking of rattle bags and bone wands. Both tasks seemed to carry equal significance. The scanner bed elevated him and tilted him backwards. Manipulator arms, some of them fitted with sensors, others with the finest micrometer tool heads, clicked down around him in a cage like a crouching spider. They started working, twitching and brushing and scurrying. He felt the tickle of scan beams the nip of pinpricks, the sting of diagnostic light beams penetrating his held open eyes. He looked up, past the surgical lights, and saw himself full length, reflected in the tinted canopy of a body scanner. He had the there we go. All five custodes' legs are done, and, more and I'm ready to move on the to the torsos. Once possessed. The muscle definition was impressive. There was not an ounce of fat on him, nor was there any sign of the old augmentic. He had the makings of a moustache and a beard, a fuzz of growth a few weeks thick. His hair was shorter than he chose to wear it, as if it was growing back in after being shaved. It was darker than it had been since his 50th birthday. Behind the beard growth, his face was still his own. Younger, but still his own. This fact filled him with greater relief and confidence than anything else that had happened since he had woken. It was the face of Caspar Ansbach Hauser, 25 years old, back when he was headstrong and arrogant and knew nothing about anything. This latter detail seemed more than a little appropriate. In the reflection, dozens of hands in gloves of patchwork skin worked on him. You re Hey, Ravi. Me, he said. There was significant damage to your limbs and to your internal organs, said the Well, Isaac. welcome to the, ch to the channel all the same. Over a period of nine months... We used mineral bonding and bone grafts to reconstitute your skeletal mass. Also, just a heads up, I set up a bot, so I'm working on experimenting a little bit with that and the functions. Your organs are primarily gene copy transplants. Your skin is your own. My own? Removed, replenished, rejuvenated, retailored. You skinned me? They did not reply. You worked on my mind, too, he said. I know things. I know a language I didn't know before. We did not teach you anything. We did not touch your mind. And yet here we are conversing without a translator. Again, they did not reply. What about the eye? Why did you take my eye? Why do I keep going blind in my left eye? You do not keep going blind in your left eye. The sight in your left eye is human normal. It is your eye. Why did the warrior take my right eye? You know why. It was an implant. It was not your eye. It was an optical recording device. It was not permitted. Therefore, it was detected and removed. But I can see, the uplander said. We would not blind you and leave you blind, said the Ice Creek voice. He looked up at his reflection. His left eye was the eye that he remembered. His right eye gold and black pinned was the eye of an adult wolf. Rector Juve called them in just as the moon rose. All the children had spent the day outside because the weather was clement and the grids had forecast no rad clouds or pollution fogs on the desert highland. The children had worked outdoors, especially the older ones. That, the rector taught, was the purpose of community. The parents, all the adults, 
They were raising the city, the great city of Ur. They were gone for months at a time, away in the sprawling work camps that surrounded the vast street plan that the architect had marked out on the chosen earth. Rector Juve showed the children scenes from pharaonic Egypt in old picture books. Gangs of industrious laborers with uniform asymmetric haircuts pulled ropes to raise the travertine blocks that made the monuments of Egypt. This, he explained, was very much the way their parents were working, pulling together with a single purpose, to build a city. The difference, he added, was that in old Egypt, the builders were slaves, and in Ur, the workers were free men, come willingly to the task, and all according to Catholic teachings. Though they could not work on the city itself, the children still worked. They harvested fruit and vegetables from the tented fields and washed them and packed them to be shipped to the work camps. They patched and mended worn clothes sent back from the labour site in yellow sacks and wrote messages of encouragement and salvation on slips of paper that they tucked into pockets to be discovered at random. In the afternoons, the rector gave the children instruction. He taught lessons in language, history and Catholic law in the long room of the commune or out under the trees of the tent fields, or even out in the actual open in fair weather. The children learned their letters and their numbers and the basic elements of salvation. They learned about the world as well, the name of the desert highlands and the long valley and the site chosen for Ur. They learned the names of all the other communes, just like their own, where other rectors looked after other student bodies, all part of the greater community. Rector Juve had no staff, except for Nina, the nurse cook. So as the older children learned, they took charge of the younger one's instruction. The rector, at the brightest of all, used the half-dozen teaching desks in the annex beside the commune's library. Cass was only a little boy, four or five, but he was already one of the brightest. Like a lot of the children in the rector's care, Cass was an orphan, as far as the rector could determine. One of the architect's surveyor troops had found him in the cot box of an overturned track wagon out on the Radland Flats a year back. The wagon had tipped on a salt depression with no hope of writing. Its cells were flat dead and there was no sign of any adults except for a few bones and hanks of clothing about a kilometre further on. Figure predators got them, said the surveyor troop leader when he brought Cass in. The ride went over, so they walked to find water and help, and Preds found them first. The boy's lucky. Rector Hube nodded and touched the little gold crux around his neck. It was an odd definition of the word. Lucky we found him, the leader clarified. Lucky the Predators didn't. You see any Preds? The rector asked. The usual meat birds, the leader replied. Plus dog tracks, a lot of dog tracks. Big. Maybe even wolves. They're getting bolder, coming closer every year. They know we're here, replied the rector, meaning mankind, back to his old tricks with all the bonus scraps and leftovers that entails. There were a lot of orphans in the commune, because building a city was hard, but most came with names. The boy didn't have one, so Rector Juve chose one for him. A suitable name. The troops had found a little toy horse made of wood, like the horse of Ilios, in the track wagon with a child. So that made the choice easier. He called them in at moonrise. After work and lessons, they had run out into the open woods and the meadow beyond the stream that moved their wheel. The meadow grass was the last long straw from summer, bleached by sun and rads. The sky was wort blue. Stars prickled the early evening. The children chased along the avenues of trees under the tunnels of their rad black leaves. They swung and played shouting games. Thunder Warriors was popular with the boys. They made guns from fingers and death noises with their mouths and came back in for supper with skinned knees. There were always stragglers at supper call. Nina used the threat of wolves to bring the laggards in. The wolves are out there. The wolves will get you now the moon's up. He called from the back door of the kitchen. When he came in that night red-faced and out of breath, Cass looked at Rector Juve. Are the wolves here? he asked. The boy was flushed and sweating. He'd probably been playing Thunder Warriors with the older boys, running to keep up and shout as loud. But he also appeared scared. Wolves? No, that's just what Nina says, Rector Juve replied. There are Preds, so we must be careful. Dogs, most likely. 
A lot of wild dogs living in packs. They're scavengers. Sometimes they come down off the high desert and raid our midden. But only if they're bold. Only if the winter's been bleak. They're more scared of us than we are of them. Dogs? Cass asked. Just dogs. Dogs used to live with men as their companions. Some communes still keep them as guards and to mind livestock. I don't like dogs, the boy replied, and I'm afraid of wolves. He ran off to join the end of the noisy game. He ran with a little boy's acceleration from nothing to maximum speed in a blink. Rector Juve smiled, but his heart was heavy. He wondered what it had been like in the cabin of that overturned track wagon. He wondered how much a three-year-old could remember. He wondered how close the Preds had got, how close they had got to breaking into the wagon body, how terrifying they would have been. The clement weather stayed with them for several weeks. Autumn was late. In the evenings, the light spun out, long and golden, and stretched the shadows of the raveled trees. The sky was like the glass of a blue bottle. Occasional little clouds dotted the horizon, cotton white, like smoke signals lost for words. The children played out late. It was good to get open air into them, not recycle. After supper most nights, Rector Juve liked to take out his regicide set and play a game or three with the smartest kids. He liked to teach them. He even had a few old books of instruction that he was prepared to lend, but he also enjoyed the challenge of a live player, however unschooled they might be, because it was an improvement over the programmed opposition provided by the teaching desks. The rector's regicide set was very old and very worn. The case was something he called chagrin, framed with discoloured ivory and lined with blue velvet. The board, unfolded, was made of inlaid walnut, it was slightly warped, and the pieces were made of bone and stained hogany. Cass was a quick learner, quicker even than some of the older, clever boys. He had the wit for it. Juve taught him what he could, knowing it would take a long time to season him and show him a decent range of opening schemes and ending outs. As they played that night, a game that Rector Juve easily won, Cass mentioned the name of one of the other boys and said that the boy had heard dogs barking earlier that day. Dogs? Where? Up on the western slopes, Cass replied, considering his next move with his chin on his fist, the way he had seen the rector do it. Probably crows cawing, said the rector. No, it was dogs. Did you know that all dogs, everywhere in our world, all of them, descended from a pack of wolves tamed on the shores of the Yangtze River? I did not know that. It was 55,000 years ago. Where did you learn this? I asked the teaching desks about dogs and wolves. You are properly afraid of them, aren't you? Cass okay. nodded. It's sensible. They're predators, and they devour. Are you afraid two. of birds? Cass shook his head. Not really, though they are ugly, and they can hurt you. What about eater pigs and wild swine? They are dangerous, the boy nodded. But you're not afraid of them. I would be careful if I saw one. Are you afraid of snakes? No. Of bears? What is a bear? Rector Juve smiled. Make your move. They are all animals besides, the boy said, moving his piece. What are? The things you're asking me about. The snakes and the pigs. Are bears animals? I think they're all animals, and some of them are dangerous. I don't like spiders, or scorpions, or big scorpions, the red ones, but I'm not afraid of them. No. Yena has a red scorpion in a jar in his footlocker, and when he shows it to us, I'm not afraid of it. I will be talking to Yena about that. Traitor. I'm not afraid of it, though. Not like Simiel and the others. But I am afraid of wolves. Because they are not animals. Oh? <laughs> what are they then? The boy scrunched up his face, as if determining the best way of explaining it. They are... Well... They are like ghosts. They are devils, like scripture tells us about. They are... Supernatural, you mean? Yes. They come to destroy and devour, because that is their nature. Their only nature. And they can be wolves, that is dog shape. Or they can walk about in the shape of men. How do you know this, Casper? Everyone knows it. It's common knowledge. 
It may not be correct. Wolves are just dogs. They are canine animals. The boy shook his head fiercely. He leaned forwards and dropped his voice very low. I have seen them, he whispered. I have seen them walk about on two feet. <laughs> he was given some food, a basic nutrient broth and some dry biscuits, and then he was left on his own in a drafty room near the kitchen morgue. The room was panelled in white bones. <laughs> Near the kitchen morgue. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't catch that the last time. Type stamped out in their millions for the Imperial Army. Light from the lamp let him see the room around him with both eyes. He was getting used to the discrepancy between vision types. The food had come on a brushed metal tray. It made a poor hand mirror, but a mirror nonetheless. He looked at his new eye in its rubbed surface. His new eye had extraordinary night and low light response. He had spent a great deal of his time since waking, moving around in pitch darkness without even realizing it. That was why his real eye had seemed blind. It was also why the world looked spectral green, and why actual light sources flared to white blooms of painful radiance. The wolves of Fenris lived in darkness most of the time. They hadn't much need for artificial light. His new eye lacked good, defined distance vision. Everything became slightly unfocused at distances of more than 30 meters, like looking through an extremely wide-angle optical lens, the sort he had often used on good quality picture units for architectural recording. But the peripheral vision and the sensitivity to movement were astonishing. Exactly what you'd expect from a predator's eye. He held the tray up in front of his face and closed one eye, then the other back and forth. When he switched back to his wolf eye for the fifth time, he noticed in the battered reflection the half shadow in the doorway behind him. You'd better come in, he said, without looking around. The Astartes came into the room. The uplander put the tray down and turned to look at him. The Astartes was as big as all his kind, wrapped in a slate-gray pelt. His fur and his armor looked wet, as if he had been outside. He had removed his leather mask to show his face, weathered and tattooed. The uplander knew the face. Bear, he said. The Astartes grunted. You're bear, the uplander said. No? Yes, I don't know many Astartes. I don't know many space wolves. He saw the Astartes' lip curl at the use of the term. But I know your face. I remember your face. You're bear. No, the warrior said. But you might remember my face. I'm known as Godsmote now, of Tra. But 19 winters ago, I was called Fifth. The uplander blinked. Fifth? You're Fifth? The Ascomani? The Astartes nodded. Yes. Your name was Fifth? My name's still Fifth. They call me Godsmote, or Godsmack in the rout, because I've got a good swing on me. A swing like an angry god. And I once buried the smile of a blade in the forehead of a war boss. His voice trailed off. That's another story. Why are you looking at me like that? They... They made you into a wolf, said the uplander. I wanted it. I wanted them to take me. My eye was gone, and my folk. I barely had my thread left. I wanted them to take me. I told them. I told Bear to take you, you and the other one. Brom. Brom, yes. I told Bear to take the both of you. I told him to make bloody sure he took the both of you after all you did for me. Fifth nodded. They changed you too. They changed us both. Made us both sons of Fenris. It's what Fenris always does. Changes things. The uplander shook his head in slow disbelief. I can't believe it's you. I'm glad it is. I'm happy to see you alive, but I can't believe. Look at you. He glanced down at the brushed steel tray. Come to that. Look at me. I can't believe this is me either. He stood up and held out his hand to the Astartes. I want to thank you, he said. Hmm. Fifth Godsmote shook his head. No need to thank me. Yes, there is. You saved my life and it cost you everything. I don't see it like that. The uplander shrugged and lowered his hand. And you don't look too happy I saved your life, the Astartes added. 
I was then, the Uplander replied, 19 winters ago. Now, well, everything's a little strange to me. I'm adjusting. We all adjust, said Fifth. It's part of changing. Bear, he's still alive, is he? The Uplander asked. Yes, Bear's running a thread still. Good. He didn't think to come and see me now I'm awake. I don't see he's got much reason to, replied the Astartes. I mean, his debt to you is long since done. He made an error, and he atoned for it. Yes, uh, about that, the Uplander said, sitting down again and leaning back. What was his error? His oversight that he had to make amends for? It was his fault you were out there. It was his fault you fell as a bad star. Was it? Fifth nodded. Was it really? Fifth nodded again. You'll see Bear, I should think, when Ogvi calls you to Tra. You'll probably see him then. So why is Ogvi going to call me to Tra? He'll decide what we should do with you. Ah, said the Uplander. Fifth reached under his pelt and produced a limp plastic sack, tied shut. It was a miserable bundle, and the skin of the bag was wet with droplets of ice mush and meltwater. When I heard you'd come back awake, I fetched this. It's the bits you were carrying with you when you came to Fenris. Or that I could find, anyway. I thought you might want them. The Uplander took the cold, wet sack and began to unpick the knot. I mean, considering everything he went through and that it's been, you know, 19 Fenrisian years, that's impressive that he kept it. The Uplander stopped picking at the knot and looked at the Astartes. Oh. I'm sorry. No need to be. There is a place for all things, and Brom is in Upland now. That word, the Uplander said. I remember that word. When I got here, when the Ascomani pulled me from the crash site, that's what you called me. An Uplander. Yes. It meant heaven, didn't it? It meant the place is up there, above the world. The Uplander pointed at the chamber's ceiling. Uplander is someone who comes down to the land, to the mortal verse. The stars, other planets, heaven, they're all the same thing, aren't they? You thought I was some sort of god, fallen out of heaven. Or a demon, Fifth suggested. Mm. I suppose. Anyway, my point is, you know about space and the stars now. You know about other planets. You must have been to some. Now you've become an Astartes, you've learned about the universe and your place in it. Yes. But you still use a word like upland. You said Brom is an upland. Heaven and hell are primitive concepts, aren't they? Is it just the reassurance of old names? Fifth didn't reply for a moment. Then he said, There's still an upland, as far as I'm concerned. Just like there's a verse and an underverse. And as for hell... I know there's a hell. I've seen it several times. When they came to take him to see the Jarl of Tra, he was in fear for his life. This was an unnecessary fear, he reasoned, because the wolves had put significant effort into preserving and maintaining his existence. It seemed unlikely that they would expend that effort only to dispose of him. But the fear clawed him and would not go away. It hung around him like a pelt. Whatever they were, the wolves showed absolutely not a scrap of sentiment. Okay, so that one goes with they that guy. Decisions, right or wrong, that on what one like with... Things, though were probably the blink this one. instincts of accelerated warriors. He was to them a curiosity at best. The work that they had one put with that guy. Life must have been a considerable effort. This one to with them, him. With and that lives, one with that one. It <sighs> must have been a way of fending off boredom through a long winter. Fifth Godsmote came to fetch him along with others from Tra, whose names the Uplander would only learn later. Fifth was junior to them all, and from a different company. They were hulking, long-toothed monsters with shadowed eyes. The Uplander realized that Fifth's inclusion in the Honor Guard was a mark of respect shown to an officiate by his elders. Fifth had saved the Uplander and brought him to the Ite, so it was only right that he should be part of an escort, even if the escort duty would normally fall to the company veterans. That made logical sense. It made logical sense when they first came to his white bone room and summoned him with a gesture. By the time they had ascended to the Hall of Tra, a climb that had taken an hour, 
and had woven up deep staircases and rock chutes and one stomach-wrenching ascent on the wind itself, fear had mutated the logic, and the only sense the uplander could see was that Fifth Godsmote had to be present at his death as some form of punishment duty. The Hall of Tra was cold and lightless. His wolf eye caught the ghost radiation of barely smouldering fire pits. In terms of heat and light, the wolves were making no allowances for human tolerances of comfort. They had given him a pelt and an eye to see through the dark with. What more could he want? He realized he wasn't alone. The company was all around him. Their body heat was barely detectable, dimmer than the dull fire pits. The hall was a massive natural cavern, ragged and irregular, and the Astartes were ranged around it, huddled and coiled in their furs, as immobile as a sibling pack of predators gone to ground overnight, dormant and pressed close for warmth. Faces cowled by animal skin hoods were watching his approach. There were occasional grumbles and murmurs, like animals growling in their sleep or tussling over bones. As his eye resolved the scene better, the uplander saw some evidence of movement. He saw hands casually raise silver bowls and dishes so that men could sip black liquid from them. He saw hunched shapes engaged in the counter game Neftuffle that the uplander had seen Scarcy playing. Little heed was paid to him. Tra Company was resting. They had not assembled to give him audience. He was just something being brought through their hall so that business could be settled. He was a minor. Yeah, right. should be have finished the heads the before I got to sign off tonight. The highest point of the cavern was Ogvai Ogvai Helmscrot, High Wolf, Packmaster, Jarl of Tra. Just from his bearing, his authority was beyond question. He was big, long-boned, a runner who would make pursuit relentlessly across waste and tundra with immeasurable stamina. His hair was long and straight, centre-parted, black, and his head was tilted back to invest his black-circled eyes and clean-shaven jaw with a commanding arrogance. The centre of his lower lip was tagged with a fat steel piercing that gave him a petulance that seemed childish and dangerous. He slid forwards off a mound of battered old skins to get a look at the uplander. So this is what a bad omen looks like when it stands up in your face, he asked no one. The uplander's breath was steaming the frigid air, but barely a curl escaped Ogvai's mouth alongside his words. Astarte's biology was marvelously adapted for heat retention. The Jarl was wearing a laced leather jacket with no sleeves. His arms were long and his skin was sun-starved white. There were dark tattoos on the albino flesh there. He stretched one arm out and took up a silver bowl. It was full of a liquid so dark it looked like ink. The Jarl's fingers, curled around the lip of the silver lanks, were armoured with dirty rings. The uplander imagined the Jarl wore them less for decoration and more for the damage they would do to the things that he hit. Ogvai took a sip and then offered the lanks to the uplander. He held it out. He can't drink that, said one of the escort. The odd will go through his innards like acid. Ogvai sniffed. Sorry, he said to the uplander. Wouldn't want to kill you with a toast to your health. <laughs> that is just such a space wolf thing. The of the drink. There was blood in it too, he guessed. Liquid food, fermented, chemically distilled, extremely high calorific content, more akin to aviation fuel than a beverage. It keeps the cold out, Ogva remarked as he set the bowl down. He looked at the uplander. Tell me why you're here. I'm here at the continuing discretion of the route. The uplander replied in Yuvik. Ogvai curled his lip. No, that's why you're still breathing, he said. I asked why you're here. I was invited. Tell me about this invitation. I sent a number of messages to the Fenris Beacon, requesting permission to enter Fenrisian world space. I wish to meet with and study the Fenrisian Astartes. One of the escorts standing behind the uplander snorted. That doesn't sound like a request that we would say yes to, said Ogvai. Were you persistent? I think I sent the request with various elaborations about a thousand times. You think? I can't be sure. I had a log of the precise number with transmission dates. My effects were returned to me, but all my data slates and notebooks were missing. Written words, said Ogvai. Written words and word storage devices. 
We don't permit them here. At all? No. So all my notes and drafts, all my work, you destroyed it? I would think so. If that's what you were idiot enough to bring with you. Don't you have backup off-world? Nineteen great years ago I did. How do you record information here on Fenris? That's what memories are for, said Olgvai. So you sent this message a lot. Then what? I got permission. Permission to set down. Coordinates were given. The permit was verified as a start is. But during planet fall, my lander suffered a serious malfunction and crashed. It didn't crash, said Olgvai. He took another sip of his ink black drink. It was shot out of the sky. Wasn't it there? Nearby, at the foot of the Jarl seating mound, one of the dark masses of huddled furs stirred. You shot him down, didn't you, Bear? There was a grumble of reply. Ogvai grinned. That was why he had to come out and rescue you. Because he shot you down. It was a mistake, wasn't it, Bear? I recognized my failing Jarl, and I was sure to correct it, Bear replied. If you knew all this, why did you ask me? asked the uplander. Just wanted to see if you remembered the story as well as I did. Ogvai frowned. Your telling's not up to much, though. I'll put that down to the fact that you've been in the icebox a long time, and your brain's probably still frosty. But as a scald, you're not really what I expected. As a scald? Ogvai leaned forwards and rested the elbows of his long white arms on his knees. His pale skin glowed in the gloom like glacier ice. Yes, as a scald. I'll tell it now, then. I'll tell the account. Gadrath, who came before me, he warmed to your messages. He talked to us in Tra, and to me, who was his right hand, and to the other Jarls, and to the Wolf King, too. A scald, he said. That would be amusing, diverting. A scald could bring new accounts from up and out. And he could learn ours, too. Learn them and tell them back to us. This is what you thought I'd be? asked the uplander. Is it what you thought you'd be? asked the Jarl. You wanted to learn about us, didn't you? Well, we don't give our stories cheaply. We don't give them to just anybody. You sounded promising and eager. <laughs> then there was the name, said one of the escort behind the upland. And slightly Ogvai suicidal. And the Tra veteran stepped forwards. He was lanky and grey-haired, with blue tattooing writhing up and out from the edges of his leather face mask and across his deep brow. Platted grey beard tails sprouted from the mask's lower rim. What's that, Iska? asked Ogvai. The name he gave us, said Iska. Ahmed ibn Rustar. Oh, yes, said Ogvai. Jarl Gedroth, rest his thread, had a romantic soul, said the warrior. Ogvai grinned. Yes, it appealed to him. To me, too. I was his right hand, and he looked to me. He didn't want to appear whimsical or weak, but a man's heart can be touched by an old memory or the smell of history. That's what you intended, wasn't it? He was looking directly at the Uplander. Yes, said the Uplander. To be honest, after a thousand or so messages, I was willing to try anything. I didn't know if you'd know the significance. Because we're stupid barbarians, said Ogvai, still smiling. The Uplander wanted to say yes. Instead, he said, because it's old and obscure data by any standard, and that was before I knew you kept no written or stored records. Long ago... Before old night, before even the rise of man from terror, and the outward urge, and the golden era of technology, there was a man called Ahmad ibn Rustar, or Ebn Rostar Esfahani. He was a learned man, a conservator who went out into the world to discover and preserve knowledge, learning it firsthand so he knew it to be accurate, to be the truth. He went from Isfahan in what we now know as the Persian region and travelled as far as Novgorod, where he encountered the Rus. These were the peoples of the Kievan Rus Kaganate, 
part of the vast and mobile genetic group that encompassed the Slav, the Sved, the Norska, and the Varangaria. He was the first outsider to integrate with them, to appreciate their culture, and to report them to be far more than the stupid barbarians they were thought to be. You see a parallel here? asked Ogvai. Don't you? Ogvai sniffed and rubbed the end of his nose with the pad of his thumb. His fingernails were thick and black like chips of ebony. They each had deep and complex patterns embossed or drilled into them. Gedrath did. You use the name as a shibboleth. That's right. There was silence. I understand I've been brought here so you can decide what to do with me, said the uplander. Yes, that's about it. It falls to me to decide. Now I'm Jarl and Gedroth is gone. Not to your Primarch? asked the uplander. The Wolf King. That's not the kind of decision he bothers himself with, replied Ogvai. Tra had Seneschal ship of the Ike the season you came along, so Gedrath was the lord in charge. This is down to his whimsy. Now I find out if Tra comes to regret it. Do you really want to learn about us? Yes. That means learning about survival. About Alrighty, guys. It is 11 o'clock my time. So I'm going to head and close it out for the evening. Uh, like I said, I don't know right now when I will be streaming again. There's still quite a few things. There's still quite a few things that are up in the air for me right now that are all going to kind of affect when I can stream and uh, the time that I can commit to it. So keep an eye on my Twitch page. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook for when I announce my next stream time. Have a good one.